Hello, my name is Keshwani. That's K E S H W A N I. Keshwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GRE. We have been solving GRE math problems out of this book here, the official guide to the revised GRE, the second edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Just give me one second, please. We are almost finished doing all the problems from this book here, all the math problems from, the, from this book. If there is something that gives you trouble, you will find a solution to the problems, problem or problems from day number 251 through 400. This book happens to contain almost all the same problems and in almost all the cases appearing on exactly the same page numbers as the problems that appeared in the first edition of the revised GRE. If you are interested in watching any of the original solutions to the problems, you will find the original solutions from day number 1 through 250. Original solutions tend to be lengthier, original solutions tend to be a little bit in depth. Right now, we are in the process of solving quantitative comparison questions out of this book here, the 10th edition of the journal GRE. Quantitative comparison questions are very important questions, very, very big part of the exam still in the revised GRE. Unfortunately, the newer book, the revised GRE books, do not provide enough practice problems. So to get some extra practice, we started solving some questions out of here, the quantitative comparison questions out of this book here, from day number 401. Right now, we are on page number 242. The very first problem on the page, problem number 9 is what we are about to do. As always, as always, as soon as I finish setting up the problem on the blackboard, you must pause the video, you must solve the problem yourself, and then compare the work that you did yourself with the work that we do together. Do you understand? That is how it should go. Do it actively, don't just sit there as a passive uh, uh, audience, you're not going to get anything out of it that way. Here's the picture that is given to us. It looks something like this. We are told that this, this thing is k. We are told that this thing is 3. This is 4. We are told that this is right angle. This is right angle we are told. We are told that this is x degrees. And we are told that this is also x degrees. I have given everything that is there in the picture. This, is, this quantity is k and this quantity is m. From here to here we are told is m. And it's very simple, the question is very simple. Number 9, when it was given in the exam, half the people had no trouble with the question, half the people missed it. Here's what they want you to compare. They want us to compare K versus N. That's all. K versus N. Pause the video, do the problem yourself, and see what you can do. I'll give you 5 seconds to pause and unpause the video while you do the problem yourself. Here we go. What we're going to do is just to just to make this picture more manageable. We're going to we're going to do some surgery on it so that is for so that it's easier for us to talk about it, so that it's easier for us to manipulate it, so that it's easier for us to actually picture the whole thing. Make this as a complete triangle. Turn it into a complete triangle. Let's call this triangle A, B, C. Now this this side from here to here we are told is four, so this is also four. So A to B, A. To B, A to B is going to be 4 plus K. Now let's look at this side here. Similarly, from here to here we are told is 3, which means this side is also 3. Are you with me? Which means that A to C, which means A to C is going to be 3 plus N. 3 plus N. What else do you notice? We must also notice that we are told that these angles are equal, x degrees and x degrees. Well, if this, this is x degrees, if angle A, B, C is x degrees and angle A, C, B is x degrees, which means this triangle A, B, C is an isosceles triangle. How does one spell isosceles? How does one do I know? Isosceles. It is an isosceles triangle, which means that these two quantities are equal. Are you with me? But that's not what they want you to compare. They want you to compare k versus n. So let's get the k by itself. Let's get the k by itself. How can we get the k by itself? Or we can get n by itself. It doesn't really matter. Let's subtract 
let's subtract uh, let's get the k by itself to get, in order to get the k by itself let's subtract 4 from both sides subtract 4 from here subtract 4 from here this 4 is going to drop out and k we find out is equal to n minus 1 k is equal to n minus 1 now we're going to write this equation in English language what it says is that k k is, is equal means is k is 1 less 1 less you see 1 less this is minus 1 1 less then n. There you go, we're done. k is 1 less than n because of the minus. k is 1 less than n. If k is 1 less than n, then of course k is smaller. Of course it's smaller. We didn't have to make all this first. We can look at it from the picture here. From the picture here it should be obvious that k has to be a smaller quantity than n because the distance from a to c is the same distance as it is from a to b. And yet, this distance is 4 and this distance is only 3. If this distance is 4 and this distance from A to B is same as distance A to C, then this K would have to be 1 less than this guy. Because here we only have 3 but here we have 4. So to compensate for the fact that we already traveled 4 feet, then K, number of feet for K has to be 1 less foot than the number of feet that we have from here to there, which is N feet. That's all. Number 10. Question number 10. Question number 10 when it was given in the exam, 61% of people had no trouble. We are told that a student scored 85 x and y on three tests with an average with an average score of 95. So a student, a student took three exams, we are told, he scored an average of 95 on these three exams and the scores were 85, X and Y. So far so good. Column A, they want us to compare the average, average of X and Y versus column B, which is 100. Again, pause the video and do it yourself, okay? I'll give you five seconds to do just that, to pause and unpause and do the problem yourself. Here we go. There are two ways we can go about this doing the problem. I'm going to do it both ways actually for your benefit. I'm going to do it the classical way. But had it been a real exam, it would be actually very silly. To, it would be a sheer waste of time to actually try to solve this problem in a classical way. You have to learn to look at the things intuitively. Here's what's going on. There are three tests, 85, X, and Y. Okay, keep listening. Okay, see if I make any sense. See what I have to say makes any sense to you. We know that he scored an average of 95. Do you understand? So what if he scored 95 in, in the second exam and then 95 in the third exam? Well, if he scored 95 and 95, then those exams will have a score of 95. But in the first exam, he did not score 95. He scored only 85. He is 10 shows. We have a deficiency of 10 points that we need to make up in these two exams in order for us to have the average of 95. You get the, you get the logic? We have to, if we can make up 10 extra points that we are short here, we have 85 here, if we had 95 here and if we had 95 and 95, the average would have been 95. We are 10 points short. Why don't we make up those 10 extra points in these two exams by, and the easiest, the quickest, the simplest way to, 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 to take care of the 10 extra points instead of making your life complicated. The easiest, the simplest, the quickest way is split, split in half. Make up five points here and make up five points here. But there you go, we are done. Now we have how many points in, uh, in this exam? We have 100 points. How many points do we have for y? We have 100 points. The average of x and y is going to be 100, of course. 100 versus 100, the answer is C. The answer is C. So that was one, one way of doing it. Another way to do this problem is to do it in a classical way. Uh, if you like, we can do it classical way over here. Academic way, the geeky way, the nerdy way, the orthodox way, the conventional way, the way that you're supposed to do like a good school girl or a good school boy. Do uh, you understand? Let's do it that way. So we have three exams, X, Y, and 
85, and we are told that the average score on those three exams is 95, which means the sum of these three numbers has to be 95 times 3. That's all it is. X plus Y is what we are interested in. Let's sub subtract 85 from both sides. So 95 times 3, 95 times 3 is going to be 15, 31, 27 plus 1 is 28. So it turns out that it is 285. If we subtract 85 from both sides, this 85 drops out. And what do you know? X plus Y equals 285 minus 85, which is exactly 200. Since the sum of X and Y is 200, their average is 100. Because to figure out the average, we have to divide by 2. The average of X and Y is 100. So that was number 10. You want to do one more? Let's do one more. Question number 11. Question number 11. Just give me a quick break. Question number 11, when it was given in the exam, 41% of the people got it right, about three-fifths of the people missed it. Here's what we are told. We are given a quadratic equation, y squared plus 4y minus 12, we are told, is equal to 0. A quadratic equation in the standard form, nothing to it. What we are being asked to compare in the two columns what we are being asked to compare in the two columns are these quantities y squared versus 30 y squared versus 30 what do you suppose well, pause the video do it yourself okay i was about to start solving it i'll give you two seconds to pause and unpause always do it on your own without my reminding you okay here we go what do you suppose is going to happen here? It's actually not that difficult, this question. It's quite straightforward if you think about it logically. That's the problem. People do not think about uh, uh, the problems that is put in front of them logically, rationally, calmly. You, you must remain calm. You must remain collected. You must remain uh, at ease. Otherwise, you will have a tendency to start looking at everything in a very academic, very traditional, very geeky way. And that takes a lot of time. Look at it logically. It's a quadratic equation, it must have two solutions. And the solutions are not going to be the same because we're not looking at something like, we're not looking at, we're not looking at x minus 2 equals uh, 0. That's not what it boils, it's going to boil down to. It's not going to have one root, it's going to have two roots. Are you with me? It will have two roots because it's a quadratic equation. And because it has two roots, we'll have two different quantities, two different values of x squared. One is going to be a positive root and one is going to be a negative root. One is going to be a positive root and one is going to be a negative root. But by the time we square the quantity, by the time we square it, by the time we square it, doesn't matter whether it's positive root or negative root, both of these quantities are going to be pos positive, but they're going to be two different quantities. And I bet you the two different quantities that we arrive at for y squared, depending on which root you use, one of them is going to be less than 30, the other one is going to be more than 30. That's what it is. The answer is going to be d here. Let's do it, do it, shall we? Let's do it together. y squared versus 30, remember, let's put it here y squared versus y squared versus 30 let's do it together so we're looking for we're looking for two numbers we're looking for two numbers such that when we multiply them we get a negative when we multiply them we get a negative 12 that's what this negative 12 comes from we also know that when we add them we need to get negative we need to get positive 4 when we add the two numbers we need to get positive 4. And that comes from this guy right here, this positive 4 right here. Can you think of two such numbers so that when we multiply them, we get a negative 12. When we add them, we get positive 4 because those are going to be our two roots. And that's where the trick part comes in. You have to think of two numbers such that when we multiply them, we get a negative 12. When we add them, we get 4. And the numbers are going to be 4, 6, and 2. Where do we put positive and where do we put negative depends on what you want here. You want positive 4 here, which means the positive sign has to go with the larger number, the negative sign has to go with the negative, a smaller number. Positive 6 and a negative 2 is going to give us positive 4, and similarly positive 6 and a negative 2 is going to give us our negative 12. So that's how we're going to break it down. So y squared plus 4x uh, plus 4y minus 12. y squared plus 4y 
minus 12 is equal to 0, we are told. We can write that as y squared plus 6y minus 2y minus 2y minus 12 equals 0. If you look at these two terms, I'm going to pick up speed now, we just so, so we, we're just factorizing it. If you look at these two terms, we have a common factor of y, take out the common factor, we are left with y plus 6. Now if you look at negative 2 and negative 12, a negative 2 and a negative 12 has a common factor of negative 2, we end up with y plus 6 again. As you can see, negative 2 times y is going to give us our negative 2y, and negative 2 times a positive 6. Negative 2 times a positive 6 is going to give us our negative 12, and this is 0. We have, a, we have a common factor of y plus 6 here, we take it out, y plus 6 comes out, here we are left with y, and here we are left with negative 2, and this is 0. Let's pick it up on the top. So now we have two quantities, y plus 6 times y minus 2 is equal to 0. Since the product of these two quantities is 0, which means either the first quantity is equal to 0, or the second quantity y minus 2 is equal to 0 or there is a third possibility which are where maybe they are both equal to 0 maybe y plus 6 is equal to 0 and y minus 2 is equal to 0 let's continue so this implies oh I erased the question didn't I lost it this implies that either either y plus 6 is equal to 0 I'm taking too long now y plus 6 is equal to 0 this is this is what you don't want to do in the real exam and that, imply, that would imply that y is equal to negative 6 or y minus 2 is equal to 0 which implies that y must be positive 2. Let's continue. So here we have y squared versus, what was this, 30? 30. If y happens to be negative 6, if y happens to be negative 6, negative 6 squared is 36 versus 30. In that case, the answer is going to be A. If y happens to be positive 2, if y happens to be positive 2, positive 2 squared is going to be 4, which is less than 30. Just like we had anticipated. There is no, there is no, there is no magic to it. There is no, there is no surprise to it. There is no suspense to it. That's what it is. It's a quadratic equation. It's going to have two roots. And since, since it's going to have two roots, when you square the two quantities, you're going to have two different values of y squared. One is going to be less than 30, the other one is going to be. But they cannot be both equal to 30, that's my point. Even if it turns out that one of them is equal to 30, even if it turns out that this thing, instead of 36, it was 30, the point here is that when you square the two different roots, it is going to have two different roots. And when you square the two different roots, they cannot be both 30. End of the story. They cannot be both 30, which means the two answers are going to be conflicting. The answer is going to be D. Do you understand? I'll see you tomorrow, okay? Bye now.